Hello. Um, welcome to um, Anticipating the Future, the, the United States in 2032. I'm uh, joined by my esteemed panelists, uh, David Goldsmith, president of the Goldsmith Organization, and um, the, uh, the Moon Hut, Project Moon Hut, uh, Tanvir Katawala, founder of Pioneer 18. Uh, nine, uh, sorry, 1890, a venture capitalist. Uh, J Jacob uh, Satiriadis, director uh, of the Center for Futures Intelligence at the National Intelligence University. And uh, Henry Beck, the state treasurer for the state of Maine. So um, thanks for making time today. And, uh, and uh, my name is Benjamin J. Butler, I'm a, an independent futurist, uh, primarily focused at the moment on uh, writing a book about uh, our future civilization. Um, so um, I, I'm asking all the guests to um, look forward 10 years uh, and have a, have a first stab at what do they foresee the US uh, and its place in the world in um, in 2032, um, and uh, in no particular order, um, would, would would anyone like to kick us off? I guess I'll, I'll go first. Uh, the, be the guinea pig here. So wonderful to be with everyone, Benjamin. Thank you for hosting this important pa uh, panel. Um, I think this is a really, uh, it, I think the best thing about being a futurist is uh, no one can tell you you're wrong until, um, until the future happens. Uh, and so, you know, I think I would say you know, 2032, I, I would say my, my larger headline is I think we're going to, because of generational change, I think the political, economic and social environment of the United States is going to look a lot different than today. And if you think about it, millennials, which is kind of the, the, the next large generational boom that will take over a lot of American society. By 2032, the oldest millennials will be 52 years old. So you have a range between 52 and 37 years old. So the millennials will now occupy a lot of the leadership of American society. So politically, we have a, 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 a the kind of the last generation of baby boomers who will lead this country. By 2032, you will see, you might have the first millennial president, you'll have a lot more millennial governors, a lot more people in Congress that will have who will be who will be of the same generation my hope is you know i think we saw during covid you know a lot of senators didn't realize even kind of don't are kind of so removed from how the technology of america works you know they you know i think there was a famous clip of a senator asking mark zuckerberg how do you make money if you if you don't charge your consumers and you know didn't understand how the online ad space works i think having that understanding of the country you govern from a technology standpoint, from a social standpoint, might bring the United States, might bring our government into better balance. So we're going to be not where we might be able to resolve some of the, you know, technology inequities from, the, you know, the problems of social media disinformation to supply chain problems, because we'll have a governing class that is a little more attuned to what that what that looks like. I think economically, I think. You know, I think in America for the baby boomers, we've always thought, you know, the dream of an American dream is kind of that white picket fence in the suburbs. I think that will be reimagined as this idea that we're going to be working from home as kind of COVID has shifted that paradigm. So maybe the American dream starts looking a lot more differently where we, uh, you know, where, you know, it's not the white picket fence, but it's that, you know, live in that condo where you kind of that has a has a home slash office slash near nearby gym. And, and we, what we think about community looks a lot different. And I think kind of socially, I think we're going to see the, the, I think COVID has started a shift as people move, as we no you can live a very successful life by not living in New York City or major cities. And I think as that continues to grow with the idea that you can kind of work from anywhere, I think that's going to shift, it's going to, it's going to shift of how, I think largely how Americans or how we're going to live in our community environments and how we're going to think about our, our political environments. I think you know, I think this idea of, you know, I don't get too political. I think identity politics and some of the wokeism, I think there's going to be a, a kind of a reckoning on how we can cope with that. Um, and I think from a business standpoint, I think there's going to be a lot of new businesses created that are going to be outside Silicon Valley. Um, and, and I think we're going to see a, a, a more um, 
equal distribution on kind of where venture capital funding goes. So um, I will uh, pass the mic to someone else. Thank you. Um, uh, J Jake, would you like to um, g give, um, um, I, I guess, you, you know, better than uh, anyone, the role of a, a futurist is not necessarily to predict the future, but but to, to look at um, uh, scenarios and, and offer preferable um, futures, um, perhaps. But um, we're, we're, what, what scenarios do you see for 2032? Yeah, thanks, Benjamin. It's uh, it's a pleasure to finally meet you, and it's great to be here with uh, all of our distinguished panelists. It's a really a great group, and it's an important discussion. I think that uh, when we just turn on the TV today and see the chaos out there in the world, when we start thinking about what our aspirational futures ought to be, um, it's it's an important question. So let me start with that. When we talk about 2032, obviously uh, we're not making any predictions about what could happen, um, but we ought to be thinking about important issues like what is America's role in the world in 2032? Uh, so let's take it from there and sort of work backwards. Um, what we're seeing today, I think, and is going to play out over the next decade is a profoundly important question. And that is, do ideas still matter in geopolitics? And the answer is yes. The answer is a resounding yes, they do. Um, we have kind of gone through this phase over the last 30 or so years let's say since the end of the Cold War, um, where many in American society, many of our political leaders believed uh, that ideology, uh, as Francis Fukuyama had written, was completely, uh, was clinically dead, uh, was no longer relevant, and that we had perhaps reached, if you will, uh, the end of history. Clearly, that's not the case. Uh, clearly, ideas still matter. And the clash of ideas that we're living through right now, I am, I am very confident is going to be uh, walking us through the next decade. And let me just kind of unpack what I mean by that. Um, we have within the United States, um, I'm, I'm not going to go out and say that there's a crisis of democracy. I think that's a little bit uh, extreme. But I think that we do have, unfortunately, a period in which political discourse is so uh, toxic uh, to the point where civil discourse is no longer rewarded uh, and disinformation has reached unprecedented levels uh, powered by the disruptive technological transformation that we're living through, which is a hugely problematic element. So we need to be able to educate our society and our citizenry to understand, um, to really reinvigorate what I would call the truth narrative. That truth narrative is important because what we're living through right now in the midst of this chaos with Russia and Ukraine um, is, is, the, is the result in the one sense of two decades of failed U.S. foreign policy through what we call the global war on terror, and we see that our society is weary and tired of military adventurism abroad. While there are a lot of voices today talking about Ukraine and Russia saying, what is it that we can do? Um, I think that the last two decades certainly cloud the experience uh, and the amount of money and blood and treasure that's been spent uh, on, on the last two decades certainly has an impact on uh, America's options today. So when we get to 2032, the question is, uh, is China's neo-Confucianist model, this sort of author authoritarian capitalism that we see, uh, where you can have capitalism without democracy uh, and grow society and grow an economy at a rapid pace, uh, different, little, different model in Russia where you have more of a neo-Eurasian model, um, which I think is being quite contested today. Uh, but yet um, the idea that ideas, that these ideologies actually have a profound effect on foreign policy and are actually distorting what we might call rational self-interest is really uh, important. So the question for America is, if the United States in 2032 continues on with its narrative of maintaining global military dominance, um, that's, that's a question that I think American taxpayers and society uh, has, has to look at very carefully uh, in terms of what that's going to cost and what uh, we're prepared to do uh, if that's the case to maintain that position. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, David, would you um, sure. like to open with a four, four minutes? Let's start with the belief that uh, forecasting, is um, being a futurist is extremely difficult. Being a forecaster is a lot easier. So I like to say that I'm a forecaster. I put together pieces of data, extrapolate and unextrapolate different conditions, and then be able to decide what that may be. And one that is uh, always prevalent when we're talking about the future is, are you talking about 2030? Uh, two thirty-five. Are you talking about possibilities that might happen that are so vague that we don't get anywhere? 
So the challenge that I have is if we go back to the 1960s and 70s, it was dreams, sex, drugs, rock and roll, change the world. In the United States, we're going to have this amazing resurgence where we're going to take care of this planet and take care of everything. Let's fast forward. Those same generation of individuals became the mega mansion owners. I don't believe that in the next 10 years, if we're actually adding 10 years onto our lives, I don't believe in 10 years will that be that much different. I look out my window, I haven't seen a flying car in my entire life. And yet we've been promised flying cars. I've been promised that we'd get up in the morning in a new environment and take a different type of shower and have different type of food. I got in a bed, there were sheets over me. I took a shower, I used water, used a toilet. I flushed it like when I was a kid. And when I went downstairs and I took, I had to heat something up, I used a microwave, which is 50 years old. So my prediction 2032, when it comes to the human condition, is we won't be that much different than we are today unless some of the big mega challenges <clears throat> impact us. Climate change, mass extinction, ecosystem collapses, displacement, social, political, economic, religious, as well as uh, explosive impacts, such things as the overfishing of our oceans, the challenges we're having in the rainforest with over 3,000 square miles being cut in one year. And the following year, we met it half year, half the year. So the con combined conditions, if you look at the United States in 10 years, I will be seven, 68 years old. I don't think our conditional life will be that different, but I do believe that there's going to be influences that impact us greatly. There'll be border conditions that are uh, conditional by climate change. Those climate change conditions are going to have, for example, up the Eastern seaboard or in the South, we're gonna have warmer temperatures. We're going to definitely for sure have more extreme conditions when it comes to uh, the droughts and we'll have higher volume of hurricanes and tornadoes and, and cyclones around the world that are going to cause countries to be competing against one another for types of resources and be instability. So the United States as a society as a whole, I think will actually get worse. I think the social media conditions that have led us to today, which is only 10 years from now, will raise a generation of individuals who will not be traveling at the same rate, will not know other cultures the same, and put up barriers to how this world will operate. So we'll have more challenges within the United States as to what does that mean in terms, to, in terms of being an American. And that conflict will be with, between families, between states, between religious groups, and on and on and on. As for the salvation of technology, we do, we're not that different than we were 10 years ago. I mean, I do have a mobile phone. I can order from Amazon. I can turn on my heat from my room, but I don't think our lives are going to be that much different. So the expectation that in 10 years, when it comes to our living conditions, I don't think we'll see that. But I will see on the global, I do believe in the global stage, we will have to address humanitarian aid around the world. And America is going to have to decide what their participation is. And the challenges at home will be far greater than they ever have been. And it will be a, a real challenge for us to be able to manage this whole global supply chain, uh, uh, just being neighborly and having the world that we've had for the past 50 years, which has more or less been pretty darn good. We're gonna enter into a world of more conflicts, more changes that all of us have never experienced for our lifetime. Thanks, David. Um, I, I, I think I'm slightly in your camp in terms of technology um if you listen to the futurists of silicon valley uh um lots of promises are made and um the the venture capitalist peter till um often says if you look if you look back at uh uh at, uh, and compare our life today to when we put um man on the moon um a, a typical if you look at a typical home um the major difference is a few screens uh, and, and and I think he's he's quite right. And um, I'm definitely in the camp that crisis, uh, geopolitical, political, uh, climate um, crisis will actually accelerate lots of changes, um, even perhaps more so than technology, which puts the pressure on the, the politicians. Um, and so um, I, I've uh, I've left the best for for last. Um, um, Henry would. Would you like to um, uh, talk about the prospects of uh, America in, uh, in 10 years time and um, what it's like to be a, a policymaker in these uh, incredible uh, changing times?
Well, certainly it's nice to be with all of you and it's very nice you had me go last because I can pick and choose from uh, the other four about um, what I think. I mean, and I mean, like you, I essentially agree with with Mr. Goldsmith's main message. Uh, it's, I don't know if it's, uh, um, I don't want to say his message is cynical, but it's probably less cynical, but I agree with the main point that there will not be as much change as we either expect or hope. Um, I mean, I really like, it is true. I mean, for years we've been wondering when we will get up and begin our day like the Jetsons, right? And that just may not be coming anytime soon. Um, to, to Tanjeev's point though about sort of, I mean, yes, we will see more millennials within the composition uh, of, you know, the U.S. Congress, probably more so, more so than the U.S. Senate. There in fact are a lot of millennials in Congress now, uh, more and more every cycle. I, I am... Uh, unsure uh, just how far left, though. Uh, and by the way, I'm a, a Democrat, for example, but I am just really very unsure how far left uh, voters, the electorate, society will go in 10 years. Certainly, you will see more people moving more to the left than you do now relative to now, but that's just sort of the nature of the passage of time and progress, um, I believe. I do think because of some experiences in 2008, 2009, and now COVID, um, it has been interesting to me to, to see the attitude, uh, you know, economic ag- attitudes, labor attitudes are much more left e- even than our parents, uh, right? I, th- I think that will occur. What will be an important test for ideology will be, I think, fiscal policy in 10 years and foreign policy in 10 years. Um, I'm not sure if uh, the country is as isolationist as we've, we've come to believe uh, because of the attitudes of, of Trump, et cetera. Um, but yes, in, in, in some, there will be change, positive change, negative change, not as much as we, as we, as we um, maybe predict now. Two very specific things I'm willing to say. One's controversial, one's not. I do think, I disagree with David on this, I, I do think we will see, or I'll add on to what David said, we will see more electronic vehicles. Uh, those, are, those are coming, those are here, those are names. Not the flying cars. That's right, which is different. I guess it's not the same thing. But uh, That's 2022. Really, because you're finally seeing that infrastructure outside of the major cities, right? I mean, it, it is remarkable to see just in the past two to three years, seeing the, the charging station infrastructure. Of course, the president's very much on board with EV. And there's it will become sort of a, a consensus bipartisan thing because it, it conjures up images of the auto industry in the Midwest. So I, I think EV is here to stay. I think uh, Bitcoin is a, is a it's an asset class, but I think it's an absolute bubble. I don't think you'll be seeing that in 10 years. I think no one here has really said that, but I hear that a lot and get asked that a lot. And I'm taking the opportunity to say, no, I don't think Bitcoin is, is the future in 10 years or otherwise. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, um, so I, um, but perhaps uh, if we could keep um, the, the next few topics to just a couple of minutes. Um, and um so here's a here's a provocative uh, question: Will will the U.S. even exist in 2032? Um, so please please uh, interpret that as you as you will. Um, will um, the fundamental relationship between the states and federal government shift? Um, will we see a a state try and secede from the union, or will there um, what will the political landscape look like? Uh, will we so from the the crisis of the last election and and and, and um, what happened on uh, January the sixth, we we have further crises uh, like this. Um, it seems clear to me um, as an as an outsider that that certainly the bifurcation of the political climate seems to uh, be um, not not abating. Um, so, um, uh, uh, Jake, would you like to kick off on this this topic? Sure, Benjamin. We'll uh, we'll dive into that. I mean, the question itself is uh, you know is an important one. I understand. Um, if I actually, if I could jump real quickly into one thing that we mentioned before, which is this idea of equating the future with technology um, as it relates to this, I think that's really important because that the, the example everybody was mentioning is the Jetsons, right, and kind of thinking about the future in those terms and from that lens. And what we're seeing actually is when we equate the future um, through purely technological terms, we, ent- we tend to miss um, a lot of the socioeconomic and 
uh, and political and religious and other types of movements that have an equal amount uh, of influence and actually will shape those various futures, uh, I think, as much. And so when we talk about the question that you mentioned is, will there be a United States? Um, uh, I, I would say yes, there, there definitely will be a United States, but there are today, arguably, uh, depending on where one sits on the spectrum, uh, various versions of the United States uh, today, right? I mean, uh, if we talk about somebody's um, lived relationship to the real, to, to their own reality, uh, I think you could definitely make the argument that there are different pockets of what we would define as the United States out there today. Um, certainly, there is um, a very toxic political climate um, that's been exacerbated, I think, by the global pandemic that we've all lived through. On the flip side, I think there is perhaps a silver lining in that through the pandemic, we've all been given a bit of a mental reset to understand how quickly things could truly change. Um, if we all would have been, you know, we're talking about a 10-year time horizon for 2032, um, you know, if we would have been having this conversation just you know, four years ago and said the whole world is going to be shut down for a period of over two years, right, it would be, would, would think that that would, is an extreme statement. So um, certainly these, these, these massive changes uh, that are going to, that, that have happened and that can force uh, all of these radical reshufflings uh, that we're seeing um, are always going to be a potential outcome. Um, where I see the danger, though, um, is where we've got entrenched um, political interests and, frankly, politicians who are more concerned um, with sort of whipping up a base uh, on, on both sides of the political spectrum in the United States uh, and less concerned sort of with being statesmen and um, less concerned with looking at uh, the United States uh, from a more, a more holistic view outside of, uh, you know, a narrow sort of political uh, agenda I think that's that's truly uh, a problem. And I think at the same time, um, how we define what the United States role in global politics is going to be will play a pivotal, uh, will have uh, have major influence uh, in, in how that domestic political discourse is, because that impacts uh, our not only our, you know, our entire national budget. And we're seeing for the first time uh, in really ever that we have younger Americans today, if, if you just look at some polling, uh, that don't fundamentally believe anymore in the United States traditional economic model, um, which says a lot about sort of how Americans are even defining the society they want to live in. Um, so I think that there needs to be some sort of a new consensus that has to be forged. Um, and that needs to be, be, move away from polarizing extremist voices on both ends of the right and the left of the political spe spectrum in this country. Um, COVID was a great opportunity for the country to come together. Unfortunately, that isn't the case. Um, but I am optimistic um, that will that the United States will emerge uh, from this experience, uh, re-energized and uh, reclaiming the role in the world. I think that that it needs to play in order to maintain uh, the stability of of the current international order. Great, thank you, um, Tanvir. What, what's uh, what's your opinion? Well, I have to say I, I agree with uh, many things that that uh, Dr. Jake said, um, but. You know, I think what I hear from everyone's comments and their opening remarks is that we have a crisis of our institutions. Um, America, you know, if we just call it a spit here, America has lost the ability to make long term plans and mobilize resources and visions to achieve them. Um, I mean, let's like in the in the probably the single greatest generational challenge like during covid, the most effective thing vaccines come from a great government program. It, basically, the government was the best thing the government could do was write checks. Um, it wasn't there was no it was not marshalling man to walk on the moon like in 1969. It was not, you know, um, pulling together resources and, and programs to achieve to achieve something that we couldn't think that was possible. And I think, frankly, the danger of what if the United States is, you know, to ask you to kind of frame it in your question is I think the United States will have to, in the next 10 years, will have to think about what does it want from its institutions, right? We're a very divided society. I think we're a divided society because, you know, I think globalization has, has, has benefited some greatly and to some not so greatly. And I think the, you know, as I, not to harp on this point again, but I think generationally, as we become a, you know, a, you know, a, there's a great historian, Neil Strauss, who kind of writes about this. America, the composition of America changes from generation to generation. I think the fact that we're going to have, we're going to be a, in 10 years, I think a very generationally different country. And hopefully the next generation will, will understand that, you know, 
political gamesmanship and in, in short term thinking. Eventually, I think there's that scene in, in that famous HBO series about Chernobyl. You know, every lie we tell has a cost. And the more and more we delude ourselves to, to, to denying climate change or denying things that, that are really existential problems, we will, we will only hurt ourselves. So I think America has the ability to kind of retake um, a lot of global leadership and, 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 and kind of reinvent itself. Um, which is American history has proven that through, you know, uh, coming out of the Great Depression to win World War II to, to land on the moon. I think that America can do it. I think it's going to be a question of whether we are something's going to shake us out and going to change us, you know, change us the paradigm. Right. Thank you. Uh, da da David. Uh, several quick points. First, I would I'd like to say that I'm not a pessimist in pessimistic in terms of looking into the future. I have a, we have a 45 year plan in the project we're working on. We have a nonprofit 501c3. I do own normal corporations, but we have teams of pe people around the world working on changing the exact future of how we live on this planet in a way that not trying to be boastful, because that's not what we are, is that we have some plans that we think will be able to modify the next generations of how we live. Number two is I'm not sure. I think um, Benjamin, I, you've been here in Hong Kong now, I believe, correct? Uh, I'm, I'm in the UK at the moment. You're in the UK at the moment. Okay. Yeah. I lived through the fall of Hong Kong. It's not officially fallen, but I lived there. I was through the first yellow umbrella. I was there through the, the last yellow umbrella. I have seen what has happened when it's not a war, but an actual overthrow or a change of, of guard. Hong Kong was one of the most amazing places on the planet. I've worked in over 50 countries, not spoken, but actually worked, traveled the world. And I've got to tell you, there was nothing like it on this planet. And that society has fallen in a way that I speak to my friends every day. It's not the same. So we have to be careful of things such as COVID and saying that's a solution or that could have been a solution. If we take the actual numbers, there were in 1918 to 1920, it actually took five years. It wasn't two. Data comes back to 20, 20, 1923 was really the end. But in, in that time frame, 50 million to 100 million people died. The equivalent today would be 250 million to 500 million people dying. We have not had the impact of what the, the previous pandemics have incurred. So we didn't get that, if you want to say that ramp of a new sense of society and a new sense of culture, because the numbers were so insignificant relative. And we didn't see people die. We only saw their feet because of privacy. Seeing people die going down the street in a, in a wheelbarrow makes a difference. Two other qu very quick points. There's a discussion that this whole generation will change the next generation. Societally, if you look through history, the older people do tend to be in governance. It tends to be the 50 or 60 year olds. Well, today people live longer and that's why we're seeing more older gen in politics, which causes a divide. They're bringing with them what they had from 50 years ago and not as current. It doesn't mean that the younger people have better solutions. It just means we have to be careful People are living longer, they get to participate longer, and they bring those same beliefs with them. And the last one is, I do believe we will exist in, in 10 years, by 2032. The challenge is that what does existing mean? Having the walls, the structure, and around us, a lot of it will be protectionism. It will be from climate change, mass extinction, resource depletion. It will be from unrest. It will be from the challenges that the world will be throwing at us as, as human beings in all societies, not just this society. And people are going to want to huddle together to be able to figure out what the next move are and that's what i believe will be in 2032 great thank you um uh henry what's your uh, what's your take so we certainly will exist uh as we do now i don't think there'll be any fundamental change to our constitutional structure uh for example to your question about you know the tension you know uh between the federal government and the states or among the states uh, I tend to think that it's just always been present. I don't think it's particularly um, kinetic right now. I, I do think there's general political polarization uh, between essentially two camps, but I don't believe you'll see so much identity tied to say states and, and, and succession and civil war between the states and that sort of thing. Um, some points that have been made earlier uh, about you know a change in political attitudes. I think the real question is you will see 
more, you know, uh, more leftist views on the economy and economics and money and spending, the question is, will you see a more liberal society overall, liberal in the American political sense? And I, I, I'm not sure you will. Um, I think it will be this reaction uh, to identity politics that might be counterproductive. Um, you'll see society move left on economic issues, but, but maybe not, not others. So what does that mean for our, our sort of our place in the world? Um, it, it weakens sort of our economic position around the world, which is just uh, not something, something we want to avoid. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I mean, that, that was going to be my ne next question, really um, hone in, in a little bit um, on um, uh, America's place uh, in the world in, in 2032. Um, and, um, you know, you, you could go to, one can discuss economics or, or geopolitics and of course as we've seen with um the events of last week they're um in intricately uh connected um and um in my former life uh, i uh was in the investment world and ran a, ran some funds and and i i always look at geopolitical uh, um events as well as macroeconomic cycles but um um, do you think that um, maybe kicking off with, with Jake, um, do you see us ending up in this? Um, I, I'm not sure whether it's a G2 world um, uh, because that implies a, a conversation. Um, but um, are, are we going to end? Are, are we going to be left in 10 years' time with um, the US and the West on the one hand, and China, Russia, and and um, some of the Eurasian powers on the other side. Are we moving into a multipolar world, or are we moving in, into a more of a Cold War situation? Yeah, thanks for the question, Benjamin. Um, it's, it's, you know, this is a fun time to be having this discussion. Although it's, uh, I know the uh, the circumstances are certainly uh, not so. So let me just say, with respect to that. Um, I wouldn't say that it's going to be a, a sort of a G2, as as you said, or even um, sort of this, you know, Cold War 2.0. Um, I think that's what you're hearing in the media today. A lot of people are talking about Russia trying to resurrect the Soviet Union. Um, I, I would actually, I would disagree with that statement. I don't, I, Vladimir Putin himself uh, is not a fan of the Soviet Union. So um, I would say that um, what we're actually looking at now is, uh, I think we're going to be seeing more of an acceptance of uh, spheres of influence in the world, um, where, um, you know, like I said earlier in my comments, uh, there was this idea that we, we had a unipolar world. I think we've been, frankly, in, living in a very multipolar world for, for a while now. Um, and I think that the acknowledgement that unless uh, the United States and uh, its Western allies are willing to uh, underwrite uh, large military and security adventures globally, um, I think there's going to be a case uh, to be made for uh, extending spheres of influence uh, to, to places like China and Russia uh, and others as well. So I, I don't think I don't think we I think I think we have to also include many more players in the conversation. What we hear is this uh, narrative of great power competition that's limited just to the U.S., Russia and China. Um, the world is much bigger than that. Uh, there are going to be many more important players uh, that we're going to be seeing in there. I mean, if we just look, for example, from a regional perspective, um, look at uh, the disruption in the eastern Mediterranean that we've seen uh, from Turkey, which is a NATO ally on the one hand, but on the flip side has been pursuing policies um, that are completely, uh, I, would, I would say, aligned against uh, many of its NATO partners um, and, and is sort of creating uh, instability in the region. You know, when we talk about getting involved in the civil war in Libya and in invading northern Syria, um, you know, and spreading sort of this, um, instead of a secular uh, worldview, more of a, a pan-Islamist view, even replacing Saudi Arabia's role in terms of exporting political Islam. So I, I think we're going to see a lot of sort of regionalist powers, as I mentioned, like Turkey, have an important role to play. Uh, the United States and the Western allies are going are to continue to drive this narrative of maintaining uh, as much as they can uh, that the, the liberal institutionalist order that we're living through now, keeping free markets open. However, at the same time, um, it's going to be easier for malign actors to be able to exploit things uh, through cyber operations when we, we become more dependent, for example, on 
on automation as we see over the next 10 years, uh, advancements in artificial intelligence and quantum computing, those kinds of shifts uh, are gonna have uh, very important effects, residual effects, uh, and frankly, transformational effects, much more powerful than just residual, transformational effects that I think are gonna shape the trajectory of geopolitics as well. Um, so it's definitely, um, a, the question I guess that I would end with is, um, if we're willing to accept spheres of influence uh, at what cost? And on the flip side, if we're not, at what cost? Uh, you know, at, at what point does sort of guaranteeing global security uh, not make sense for the United States? Great. Thank you. Um, uh, Tanvir, what, what's, um, what's uh, your, your view? Well, I think uh, Jake said, uh, I, I kind of agree with some, some of his sentiments, but yeah, I, I think in the end of the day, I don't think Americans, I think after our 20 long year war in Iraq and Afghanistan, I don't think Americans have that much of an appetite nor think it's in our national interest to, to be upholding the kind of post-World War II security order. I think this, I think this idea, I think, and because of that, I don't, I think you are going to see regional power start flexing their muscles and start taking territory. And I think we're going to have a much more of a quilt war. It's going to be the Cold War ended and became America as a hegemony. And I think the, the American hegemony is going to be less powerful probably 10 years from now than it is today. Um, I, you know, I think the caveat to that is, is I think, you know, the, a lot of commentators, what the, the, the city of East chap and then David Goldsmith probably lives it right. China is a country that wants a, uh, that sees itself as the next great civilization. They think, you know, they, their history has, they, they want to be a preeminent world power and, you know, you know, you know, one belt, one road initiative, some of the things that they're doing, you know, look at what they did to, uh, I think in Sri Lanka, taking the port with some of their, their kind of how they do the, your infrastructure loans. I don't know, maybe they might overplay its hand and, you know, America kind of regains our, our influence or, you know, that maybe the, we have, uh, you know, what's going on in Ukraine happens in Taiwan and maybe that changes our calculus. Um, so, you know, I think, I think the, if, if I'm a betting man, I think Americans are going to, for the next 10 years, at least for the for next short term future, are going to retreat inwards than want to play a role in global affairs. Great. Great. Thank you. Um, David? In the movie, The Wizard of Oz, the individual pulled back the curtain and showed the man pulling the levers. If we want to talk what the future of the United States is on the global stage, the United States just had the curtain pulled back for the world to see in multiple different scenarios, whether it be uh, the behavior of senators and congressmen, whether it be the uh, what had happened through the pandemic and the, the discourse that happened across the entire nation. I do believe that optics are important. And from my perspective, the American optics the future, the dream is no longer the same. So on the global stage, we will lose and we are losing the battle as to is that the predominant way to live and have a society? What There is a lot that could be said bad about many countries, including the uh, America. In China, their infrastructure is beyond amazing. I mean, if you've ever spent time in, in Asia, in China, it, it's mind-blowing. They have the cars that are remote controlled or autonomous in terms of buses and infrastructure. They do have high speed trains. There are cities to nowhere and they did start the Belt and Road Initiative. They have had serious challenges because they have not uh, the loan structure, as you mentioned, is an issue. So what does that translate to as, an, uh, as a society? I think that, and the position in America, I think that we're going to learn, to, we're going to have to learn, and it's gonna be a punishing lesson that our influence is being dictated by the optics that are put out. And unless something absolutely amazing comes out of America as opportunity, I think that that role will diminish over the next, it won't be uh, as significant in the next 10 years, but it will be very significant in the next 20. Great, thank you. Yeah, great analogy. I just um, showed the 1939 uh, movie edition to my seven-year-old daughter. Um, great, great, great film. Uh, and um, Henry, what's what's your take on America's place in the world in 2032? Well, I, I don't opine on foreign policy much, but uh, I mean, I think Tanvir talked about this briefly. 
I don't think we can overstate how damaging uh, the 2003 uh, deception or perceived deception uh, was on the American public uh, with regard to President Bush in Iraq. And I, I think that has just really spoiled credibility uh, with, between the populace and their leaders. Will we tend to look inward and or be isolationist is the derogatory term? I think we've always been that way, but there will just always continue to be, including 10 years from now, that tension between the population that wants to look inward and the people that sit in the seats uh, that either rightly or, rightly or wrongly convince themselves that we can't be for various reasons, economic reasons or security reasons. So in that sense, I don't think it will be that different 10 years from now. Great. Great. Thank you. Um, I know we've only got five minutes and um, um, and and it could well be the most important topic. Um, so perhaps I should have put it up on the pecking order. Uh, but um, any takes on the ecological crisis that we're facing and how that's going to influence um, uh, America in, in the next 10 years? Uh, d d d I think David's got um, dying to say say something. We, we've only got no, like no, a minute. I'm dying to say something. It's what I work on every single day. We have six mega challenges, climate change, mass extinction, ecosystem collapse, displacement, unrest, an explosive impact, overfishing, the, uh, uh, putting poisons into the ocean, not plastics, that's not as bad as the overall issue. We dump, uh, 50 th we dump 12 billion gallons of municipal waste into the ocean every day. Plastics or municipal waste, which one's worse? That's America. Europe is, 300 and, um, is 520 million people or 720, depending on how you measure it. They're worse. And if you look at Asia and India, you can probably add that's 50 billion gallons of poison, not just plastic, poison into the ocean every day. All of these things are going to be compounded as we go annually into the future. That's, that's our future. And Project Moon Hut, which is not about the moon, is about improving life on Earth for all species, is we address that every day with our team. And we have people all over the world from JP Morgan, uh, private banking, uh, KPMG, Deloitte, PwC, EY, Maples Group. We have uh, people in the space industry, not in the space industry, fund managers, scientists. We're all working on that. And we do it quietly in the background. You won't hear about us out in the, uh, on media and every other place. So that's, our, that's what we do. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Tanvir, any, uh, any thoughts? You know, I'd say, you know, I'm not the, the expert on, on kind of where climate change is going, but I, I think the, I think the, the thing that I'm most excited about, you know, there, there's a, uh, there's an astrophysicist uh, who coined this phrase that you can measure the advancement of a civilization by the amount of energy they can harness. So if you can harness the energy of a planet, you're a type one civilization. If you can harness the energy of a, of a sun, you're a type two civilization. And if you can harness the energy of a galaxy, you're a type three civilization. And there's some work that's going on. There's a company called the Commonwealth Fusion System. They're developing nuclear fission technology. And if they're successful, we actually will skip a type one civilization, we'll become a type two civilization. And you know, most scientists and futurists predict that we will be in probably the next hundred years a really defined type one civilization. You know, I, I think the technology, I think where we, where we are in renewable energy, some of the technology and investments that are going to it, I feel that there's going to be some breakthrough. Um, I feel, I think the thing that I kind of most worry about is I think the, as you see, China develop, Africa will have the largest population of, of people under 25 in the next century. And, you know, there's going to be a very hard, it's going to be very hard for us to say to the to the African continent, hey, you got to develop more renewable energy, you got to use cleaner energy, when every Western country in China basically use fossil fuels to advance its economy. And how we figure out a bridge to that, I think will be uh, the big question of our time. Great, great. Yeah, thank you. Um, Jake, uh, any thoughts on the ecological uh, crisis? Have you done some futures work around that? Yeah, I mean, I think the only thing I would say, just to add to, to the comments that have already been made, is I think there's an opportunity um, in this era of what we've all discussed already as sort of discord um, and disharmony and polarization, um, that this, is, this is, should be, really, it should be a unifying narrative uh, that can bring multiple constituencies together um, because it's something that even transcends borders. 
Uh, it's something that uh, isn't necessarily just relegated uh, to one one foreign policy agenda. Um, it's something that really should be a global a global movement for change and uh, and really an, you know an outcome uh, that benefits the entire planet. So I think unfortunately it gets it you know that narrative gets caught up in the realities of the competition uh, that we all still have to live in. And so maybe if I could just as just sort of a parting thought because uh, I know we're we're reaching the end here just. Um, you know, my grandfather came to the United States in the early 1950s with a second grade education right after the Greek Civil War uh, and was able to, um, you know, live that American dream and educate his family and build properties and businesses and homes. Uh, and and I, what I'm concerned about is that, um, you know, we, we still give this next generation the opportunity to do that. Where I'm optimistic is that um, when we talk about places like China, for example, while there's some great economic development happening there, um, I'm not sure that that same soft power and attractiveness and sort of, um, um, you know, sort of selling point, if you will, um, is going to be uh, as uh, as lasting uh, and as influential as what the United States uh, and its model puts out. And I hope that that uh, will be the aspirational future moving forward. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, I know we're in uh, overtime, um, but uh, Henry, um, any thoughts on the um, uh, ecological crisis that we face? Yes, quickly. I mean, as as Jake sort of suggested, there's now consensus. Everyone can see it, right? Everyone agrees on the first part that they're happening and will happen. Our, you know, our lobster stock is moving north towards the Maritimes. Everybody knows that. Uh, the second and most vital question for the future for 10 years from now is, do we come together on a solution? Can we agree on a solution? Uh, that will be the, the key question. Well, I was at COP26 in Glasgow. In fact, uh, uh, I was based out of Hong Kong, um, uh, as David rightly pointed out, until uh, till last year. And um, uh, movements and, and crisis uh, caused me to migrate back to my um, home nation and um, uh, at COP, I don't know whether I was, at moments I was encouraged by people from all over the planet coming together behind such an important issue. And at other times I was horrified um, by <laughs> events that were transpiring in the uh, in the blue zone where uh, a lot of the decisions are being made. So, um, but it's definitely something that's not going to go away in the next 10 years. Um, um, would just like to thank you all for making time today. Um, it's been a, been a um, insightful conversation. Um, as always, there's never enough time, but um, would love to keep in uh, in in touch with you all, and um, I'll endeavour to uh, follow uh, the work that that you're all doing. Thanks so much, Benjamin. Great. Thank thank you. Thanks, I'll, uh, Stop the streaming now. <laughs>